Hello everyone. In this video, I test the accuracy of the oxygen saturation, or in other words, SpO2 measurements of the Apple Watch Series 6. First, I'll test if it can correctly detect a drop in my oxygen levels. Second, I'll check if it ever detects a low oxygen saturation when it's not supposed to. Third, I'll test its correlation with a dedicated SpO2 sensor. And finally, I'll check how stable the measurements of the Apple Watch are when you take multiple in a row. As always, I do not want to waste your time, so timestamps are in the description below and also on the timeline. For those of you that are new to the channel, my name is Rob and I'm a postdoctoral scientist specializing in biological data analysis. Now my channel is not so much about listing features, instead on my channel I try to test the accuracy of different measurements. Before getting to the test, let me briefly introduce what oxygen saturation actually is and why it's important. In really simple terms, this is the percentage of red blood cells in the bloodstream that contain oxygen. This can be important to measure because it can be used as an indication for several medical conditions. For instance, it can be used to 1. detect sleep apnea, where you basically stop breathing for 30 seconds or more during sleep, 2. keep track of lung diseases, and 3. potentially detect respiratory infections such as COVID-19. In all these cases, your blood oxygen saturation can drop to anywhere from the low 90% to 60%. Normal ranges, on the other hand, are between 95 and 100%. Now, there are two main ways you can measure your oxygen saturation. The Apple Watch Series 6 uses what is known as reflectance pulse oximetry, basically shining light on your skin and measuring the reflected light. Something like this, which is a dedicated SpO2 monitor, uses the more established transmittance pulse oximetry, which shines light at one side of your finger and measures what comes through on the other side. I discuss the difference in more detail in a video on the Withings scan watch, but in general, transmittance pulse oximetry is considered more accurate and is used in hospitals around the world. Let's take a look at my results. To see if the watch can detect low oxygen saturation, I measured my oxygen saturation while flying. In flight, the pressure in the cabin is decreased, thereby leading to a lower concentration of oxygen, which in turn lowers the amount of oxygen in my blood. I own three different SpO2 monitors, and based on a previous video I made about how your oxygen saturation drops while flying, I found this SpO2 sensor to be very reliable. I found that it could clearly detect changes, even in the normal ranges of oxygen saturation. Here you can see how during the flight my oxygen saturation decreased. While we were parked and taxiing, my SpO2 was between 98 and 99 percent. However, as we flew higher, my oxygen saturation dropped as low as 90 percent. Then, as the airplane descended, my oxygen saturation rose again. Now, this profile here was recorded using a dedicated finger pulse oximeter, which I will use as a reference. At the same time, I also recorded my SpO2 levels using the Apple Watch. If we now plot the values according to the Apple Watch as green dots in the same graph, we get these results. As you can see, the overall patterns are the same, with a lower SpO2 level when we were up in the air and increasing SpO2 levels as we were descending, and again, normal SpO2 values at ground level. This is really good and this supports the accuracy of the Apple Watch's SpO2 sensor. Overall, the results of the SpO2 measurements are pretty good based on what we see here. The Apple Watch was able to detect my lower oxygen saturation when the air pressure was decreased and when we descended again, my oxygen saturation increased again. However, does the Apple Watch ever detect low SpO2 values when it's not supposed to, meaning at ground level? First, a quick side note. If you're interested in the latest updates on the wearables I'm testing, consider subscribing to my Instagram and my weekly newsletter. Of course, you would also make me really happy if you subscribe to this YouTube channel. Now enough self-promotion, let's get back to the tests. To collect the SpO2 data, in the morning and evening, I usually took between 4 and 8 SpO2 measurements with the Apple Watch and 4 measurements with the dedicated SpO2 monitor. I did this for 136 days and in total I took 2262 SpO2 measurements with the Apple Watch. Here I plotted those results. On the horizontal axis we have the date I took a measurement and along the vertical axis is my oxygen saturation or SpO2 value. In blue-green are my values according to the finger pulse oximeter and in red are the values according to the Apple Watch. We can already see in red that the Apple Watch more often detects low SpO2 values than the finger pulse oximeter. 
But let's take a look at this data in a different way. That is what it displayed here. In this plot, you can see the distribution of measurements according to the finger pulse oximeter in green blue and the Apple Watch in red. Both devices most often have a value between 95 and 100%, which is the normal range that we would expect. However, as you can see, the Apple Watch detects lower values more frequently and it even detects values below 95% sometimes when my oxygen saturation was actually supposed to be normal. These results indicate that the Apple Watch sometimes detects a too low SpO2 value. We saw in the beginning of the video that it will likely detect a low SpO2 value when it is supposed to. So when you get a low SpO2 reading, I think it's best to take multiple measurements over an extended period of time to make sure that the measurement you got was not a false positive. If it keeps giving low values, you might want to check that with a doctor. The next thing I was curious about was checking if there was a correlation between the measurements taken with the Apple Watch and those taken by a dedicated finger pulse oximeter. This basically means I want to check if in the normal range of SpO2 values there's a similar pattern in the Apple Watch's measurements and those of the dedicated SpO2 monitor. That is what I plotted here. I matched each individual measurement of the Apple Watch to the median value of the finger pulse oximeter that I took that morning or evening. Now the median is something similar to taking the average, but basically in a more robust way. On the horizontal axis, we have the measurements according to the dedicated finger pulse oximeter. And along the vertical axis, we have the measurements according to the Apple Watch. Each dot here is a single measurement and the blue line is the best fitting line through these points. The first thing you will notice is that the Apple Watch has a much larger range of values, also having measurements as low as 90%, whereas the finger pulse oximeter does not drop below 97%. This is what we also checked in the previous plot. As you can see, the blue line is basically horizontal, meaning that there's no association between the measurements of the Apple Watch and the dedicated pulse oximeter. To increase our chances of finding a correlation and also making the test a bit more robust, I can take the median value for both the Apple Watch and the finger pulse oximeter for each set of measurements done either in the morning or in the evening. If I do that, I get this plot. This takes away some of the more extremely low values of the Apple Watch because we're taking the median. Still, however, we see no correlation between the Apple Watch and the finger pulse oximeter. Overall, I would conclude based on these results that in the normal range of values, the Apple Watch is not able to distinguish between values anywhere in the range from roughly 95 to 99%. Only when you get to much lower values, maybe 90%, there's a chance you actually have a significantly decreased SpO2 that the Apple Watch can detect. The final thing I wanna check is how stable the SpO2 measurements of the Apple Watch are. With that I mean, if I take multiple measurements in a row, will they be similar or very different? That is what I plotted right here. On the left in red, we have the instability of the Apple Watch. And on the right side in blue, we have the instability of the finger SpO2 monitor. And I measured this using what is called a standard deviation. The closer the dots are to zero, the more stable the measurements. Now the red and the blue box here show where the middle 50% of these dots are. As you can see, on average, the measurements of the Apple Watch are way more unstable than those of the finger pulse oximeter. Meaning that if you take multiple measurements in a row, you will get a larger spread of values with the Apple Watch than with the finger pulse oximeter. One characteristic we're looking for in a finger pulse oximeter is consistent measurements. Of course, this is not the full story, but it is one indication of how good something is performing. These results again show that it's wise to take multiple measurements in a row with the Apple Watch in order to get a more reliable estimate of your SpO2 level. Overall, I'm pretty satisfied with the SpO2 measurements of the Apple Watch. When you do have a lower SpO2, it will detect it. However, it might be a false positive. So if you have a low SpO2 value, I would recommend taking multiple measurements over a longer period of time to make sure it's actually low. This means that the sensor of the Apple Watch could potentially be used to detect respiratory infections such as COVID-19. Now, people with COVID-19 sometimes feel fine even when their oxygen saturation levels are plummeting. In these cases, your blood oxygen saturation drops to anywhere from the low 90% to 60%. Now the sensor on the Apple Watch is likely also good enough for detecting sleep apnea. What it cannot be used for is detecting relatively small differences in oxygen saturation. For this purpose, the sensor is simply not sensitive enough. So should you buy the Apple Watch? Well, that depends. If you want to be able to measure your oxygen saturation on the go, then it's definitely a good choice. However, the Apple Watch is not cheap. If all you want to do is measure your oxygen saturation, I would recommend a dedicated pulse oximeter, which is much cheaper. 
Still, if you're already thinking about buying a smartwatch, I think the Apple Watch is a really good choice. In addition to SpO2 measurements, out of all wrist-worn wearables I've tested so far, the Apple Watch has the best heart rate monitor by far. Of course, there are a number of limitations to the tests I did here. First of all, to do a proper SpO2 measurement, I would actually need to measure the blood gases in my blood directly. Also, ideally, I would test it on many other people under different circumstances. In my videos, I do scientific tests on different devices like the Aura Ring, the Fitbit, and the ScanWatch. And in the end, I hope to use tracking to improve my life. So if you like that subject and like this video, consider subscribing to my channel and also consider giving it a thumbs up because it makes it easier for other people to find my videos. Thank you so much for watching and also consider watching some of my other videos.